All right, hey, uh, good morning and uh, good afternoon. My name is Dr. Jamie Meyer. Uh, thrilled to be with you folks uh, today uh, and uh, thrilled to be a uh, keynote speaker for ICMS. Uh, I apologize, first of all, I was planning on being uh, in person as much as it can be these days, but uh, had a meeting pop up that I just, uh, I have to take. So we're gonna do this recording and uh, wanna thank you for your attention. I'll certainly make myself available uh, afterwards if you have any follow-up questions. So uh, let me uh, get into this and uh, I'll pull up my deck and uh, here we go. All right, so uh, again, uh, appreciate the opportunity to uh, speak with you folks and uh, wanna thank uh, each and every one of the members of uh, ICMS. Uh, appreciate uh, what you folks do for the industry, appreciate what you do uh, around the, the world uh, in your in your home jobs and your daily jobs and then uh, certainly all you do for racing. Special thanks to Tom Weisenbach for making this opportunity possible for myself and for PRI uh, and then uh, taking care of the folks that uh, run our organization, the SEMA board. Uh, Tim Martin's your chairman on the SEMA board, just a great advocate of racing and then the PRI advisory committee, Chris Douglas who works so tirelessly as a volunteer uh, to promote racing and to grow the uh, industry. All the PRI staff, which uh, like everybody has been working real hard to help racing this year, keep it going. Uh, and a special thank you to my assistant, Emily Bowden, who did such a great job of uh, getting me ready for uh, today. So uh, what I wanna do is run you through uh, a few slides, should take about 20, 30 minutes, and then we'll end with a Q&A session uh, with Karen Davidson. But uh, I've actually dusted off an old presentation I did uh, about a decade ago. I thought it might be fun to visit that. I'm going to talk about the COVID-19 response from a PRI perspective, uh, what we've done to help the industry. We're going to go into a little bit of detail about the plan uh, as it was to hold the PRI show this week. Uh, of course, it didn't work. We had to cancel our show, but we're going to talk about that a little bit. And again, Karen's going to make herself available uh, for that. Um, I'll talk to you about the PRI Road Tour, which was our hard pivot to get out on the road, to take the show on the road, as it were. Uh, gonna take a couple slides and talk about the health of our industry uh, with some data that's just come out from SEMA. Talk about government affairs, why that's so important to the industry and what PRI is doing to be on the forefront of that. Gonna give you a little bit of an expanded look at what this week means to the industry as PRI has a lot of activities going on that you can take advantage of. Uh, and then we'll talk a little bit about 21. All right, so we're uh, gonna move into this uh, fun presentation. Uh, so a little bit of background on myself. Uh, I earned my PhD in anatomy and cell biology uh, from Syracuse Med in 1997. Uh, went on to the uh, medical school in Cincinnati for a postdoctoral fellowship that lasted uh, seven or eight years. And then of course, like every scientist, I went and worked on performance parts at one of the big OEs. I'm just kidding, of course. Uh, but I did go work at General Motors, took a position in what was then GM performance parts, got to work on marketing and sales of performance parts and crate engines. And then through a 15 year career, uh, made my way to the high performance cars, trucks, uh, SUVs and accessories line of work. Uh, and then I made a pivot uh, in May and uh, took the job as president of PRI and, and excited to be with you folks in that capacity. So along the way at GM, I had a lot of great opportunities. Uh, one of them was working uh, with charitable organizations uh, and the American Heart Association, which ironically had funded some of my research uh, during my postdoc. Uh, but we were uh, in a position where the company could give away a Copo Camaro at the time. This was Chevrolet, obviously I'm talking about. Uh, and I was invited to a Go Red for Women event in downtown Detroit uh, to talk uh, about human anatomy uh, and racing. So I dusted this presentation off and I thought you folks might enjoy it because candidly, I can't think of another time I'm gonna be able to use it, but we'll see. So uh, I got this slide in here just to uh, show you a little bit about uh, some of my research, some of my basic research along the way. And I'm realizing today this thing is 20 years old now, but uh, uh, my work was on a, a protein called NADPH oxidase, which at the time 
we knew existed in neutrophils, human neutrophils didn't know, uh, that it also existed in endothelial cells that line the blood vessels uh, of the human body. And this little uh, uh, diagram shows NADPH oxidase uh, in the wall of an endothelial cell and its involvement of free oxygen radicals and how that affects LDL, the uptake of LDL, and of course leads toward a path of atherosclerosis. So I, I took this background, I combined it with my love of racing, and that's how this presentation came away, uh, or came about rather. So uh, what I did was I had fun with what was a gen generally a, 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 a casual uh, group of folks that um, weren't really into racing, weren't, weren't necessarily in the health field, but I combined the two topics. So, so we, uh, we talked about the human heart versus a race engine. And at the time I was selling LSX engines, so we used that image and of course, a beautiful, big uh, human heart. Talk about the complexity of an engine, all the components and all of the parts that move. This is a, an LSA with a supercharger and headers and aluminum block and heads. A good example of the parts that make up an engine, right? And then the human heart, classic image, uh, four chambered pump uh, in all mammals, uh, big left ventricle that uh, so muscular and so effective at pushing blood through the body uh, and the muscles that help hold it together, the papillary muscles. So we talked about the anatomy of the heart a little bit. So what about the care and feeding of a race engine, right? Like what does it take to keep these things moving? Well, you need great air supply, you need good clean air, need an ignition system to make sure everything's firing in the right order, intake system so you can get fuel into the engine, make sure you're feeding that engine, cooling system, keep it at the right temperature, an exhaust system, a way to get rid of all of those uh, uh, wastes from combustion, good oil pressure, good oiling system. So those are just some of the systems that come together to make a healthy engine, right? And then the heart, same thing, similar thing, right? You need good air supply, you need a good intake system of fuel, ignition system, right? There's a lot of electrical components of the human heart, an exhaust system to remove uh, the waste, cooling system. You kind of see where I'm going here, right? Good oil pressure. Uh, and then uh, a fun comparison by the numbers, right? How does a race engine, in this case, I pulled the numbers from, uh, this would have been 10 years ago for all of my hardcore engine fans watching this, uh, NASCAR engine versus the human heart. Well, a NASCAR engine uh, uh, works at 9,000 RPM. It uses 125 gallons of fuel uh, in one race, uh, travels at 200 miles an hour, uh, 850 horsepower, uh, and this may be where the human heart wins out, right? A good engine is designed to last for 500 miles, maybe not much more than that. The human heart, though, moves 2,000 gallons of blood a day. It'll pump or it beats 100,000 times in a day, uh, pumps 35 million times a year, 2.5 billion beats during our lifetime. And, you know, of course, the amazing part about our hearts is that they last for 70, 80 years, and some of them are still in fine working condition uh, when the owner no longer needs them. So an interesting comparison, right? So what, ha what happens when things go wrong with a race engine? Well, we have just these catastrophic incidents. And I don't know why I only pulled drag engine pictures, but uh, they're some of the most explosive for sure. And my friend Antron Brown probably won't appreciate this if he ever watches this, but you get the idea, right? Something goes wrong with an engine, horrible things happen to you, or to the engine rather. But what about in the human heart? Well, similar things can happen, right? Uh, atherosclerosis over several decades can form these plaques in the wall of a blood vessel. And, you know, quite ironic that the coronary arteries that feed the heart itself are all, often victims of this disease. Uh, and, and of course, what happens after decades of use? Well, this is a this is a heart attack. This is myocardial infarction. This is these plaques that line the blood vessel, uh, and they eventually weaken and they collapse in on the blood vessel, and the plaque forms, 
and you have this very acute event where the heart stops feeding itself uh, and the patient, the victim, uh, can, can die from it, obviously. Uh, so uh, this is kind of the summary slide of what are these risk factors. And you know, I, you think about 2020 and you think about uh, what, what is in the news. Well, it sure, certainly isn't cardiovascular disease, but it is still the leading cause of death in the United States and in all modern societies. And the risk factors are, uh, you know, what you're born with anyways, are age, race, and a genetic predisposition. The risk factors we can control, the, the behaviors, right? The smoking, the, the diet that affects your cholesterol and your diabetes, obesity, the high blood pressure and a sedentary lifestyle. And then uh, just as a way to transition this and we'll move on to the good stuff with the, the racing industry is, you know, maybe a, maybe a new suggested risk factor is, is the year that we're living through right now, uh, 2020. So let's, uh, let's move on from uh, cardiovascular concerns and start talking about uh, 2020 from a racing standpoint, the COVID-19 response and what PRI has done uh, to help our industry. Um, you know, we immediately went into action. PRI has always been the uh, focal point of the racing industry. And, you know, we, we updated our website immediately, started putting out information, made things available to our racetrack owners, to our, uh, to our constituents. So you'll find this information on the PRI website, but uh, we set up a track promoter hotline. Tracks were in a lot of trouble in March, April, May, a lot of them being shut down. Uh, we, we offered immediate legal and government affairs assistance. There's a 50 state database located on the PRI website that gives you information state by state. This is a very regional disease, as you know that, you're probably facing that uh, in your own uh, neighborhood, your own cities. We also brought in three PRI ambassadors, Tom Deary, Frank Hawley, and Gene Bergstrom, three experts uh, with racetracks. Uh, and we, we allowed these gentlemen to represent PRI and go out to the racetracks, call the racetracks, Ask them, how are you doing? What can we do to help you? What can PRI do to help? Uh, and, and we're going to talk about those results uh, a little bit. But they were they were great. In some instances, we were able to get tracks back open or help those owners get uh, back uh, underway and get racing uh, up and going. And we also launched uh, a series of webinars, educational programming to help our racetrack owners and, and managers uh, they included new racetrack technology to help racetracks get through this pandemic uh, website resource that helped them build out their websites. Lessons learned during the COVID-19 pandemic, sharing what other tracks had brought to the table. Uh, we set up Motorsport Coalition toolkits for track operators so they could get represented in their state and their local governments. Uh, and then live streaming and motorsports thing, tools to help these tracks get exposure. So uh, Motorsport Coalitions is interesting and we, we help many states, New Mexico, uh, Pennsylvania, New York, Illinois, uh, Wisconsin, just to name a few, but our ambassadors, our legal team, our governmental affairs folks would come in uh, and help these owners get represented. And uh, as Christian Robinson from our government affairs, government affairs office says, if you don't have a seat at the table, you're on the menu. And we wanted to make sure that our tracks were well represented. So that gives you a sample of, of what we were doing while the pandemic was running uh, through the country. All right, so uh, let's talk about the health plan at PRI. We had uh, plans to run the PRI show uh, well into August, uh, and unfortunately, uh, we were unable to hold the show. Made made what we can now declare is the right decision to cancel the show. But um, I want to take you through some of those steps and what the turning point was for us, uh, so that you can uh, get an idea of what it uh, was behind the curtain, if you will, what the decision was. So. Uh, there were a lot of folks involved in this. Uh, Indianapolis is a wonderful city. Uh, they want this event. It's it's a key part to their economic 
uh, annual revenue, but more importantly, it fits their brand so well. And so many of the racing leaders are located in Indianapolis or within short driving distance. So visit Indy and the convention center staff were wonderful, the Lucas Oil Stadium staff, uh, the health departments at the city as well as, as, well as Marion County were uh, understanding right up to the end, but I understand uh, these health departments have very tough jobs right now, very tough decisions are having to be made right now. Um, and then of course we have a lot of partners in the area and they were understanding and uh, sympathetic to the situation. The, the picture we're showing here is the cover of what turned out to be an 18 page document that went into excruciating detail of every change, everything that was asked of us and how we were gonna address uh, opening a trade show during a pandemic. So we'll take you through some of that right now. And then again, Karen's gonna make herself available to you. She's the one that drafted this uh, and she's the one that uh, was ready to implement it. So um, it starts with the convention center. They had invested $7 million in health and safety enhancements. Small things like uh, uh, disinfectant uh, and hand sanitizing stations to big things like massive new uh, air purification systems and filters for the latest uh, in that technology. But, uh, you know, contactless uh, faucets and toilets, plexiglass shields, uh, the filtration, Clorox 360 systems, they had masks that were going to be required, uh, health screening, temperature checks, one-way aisles, sanitization of all, all the high traffic areas throughout the day, um, private meeting rooms uh, that we would be able to socially distance people at, uh, that Hoosier Hospitality Promise that our Visit Indy folks will be proud to talk about, and then shuttle systems where we took in the consideration of all of these things while we kept people safe. So it's important for folks to know that um, Visit Indy and the convention center were running rather sizable events. They had several basketball tournaments going on during the summer. They were bringing from a few hundred to a few thousand people into the convention center uh, with no outbreak of COVID. So with great success, and, and that was the promise. Um, we had looked at capacity limits under the direction of the Marion County Health Department. Uh, we were going to uh, change uh, time, uh, changing the limits of as we allowed folks to come in. Uh, the attendance was being limited on us as it got decreased from uh, over 60,000 to 32,000 and ultimately 15,000 uh, with a decrease uh, in exhibitors. Uh, and then probably what really killed it for us is that we were gonna have to separate the convention center and our trade show into thirds. Uh, and those folks would only be able to be in that one room for 24 hour period. So three shows of 5,000 people that weren't really connected and it, it just didn't work for us. Uh, staggered entrance times, uh, and, and we canceled social events, you know, whatever it took to make sure people were safe. So that gives you an idea of the lengths that PRI was willing to go to make sure the show went on and keep people safe. One little nugget we wanted to throw in here for you. Um, Med Next, name of a company that is available to assist you with COVID requirements if, if you need uh, help with health questionnaires and all the other requirements to put on a show. Just a quick one. So uh, what about uh, PRI and this road tour? I hope you've heard about it. Uh, if not, check it out. I wanna go through it quickly. Uh, we decided to take the PRI show on the road. There are virtual trade shows popping up. Uh, it's safe. Uh, it's also less effective. And knowing how intimate this community is, uh, we thought the right thing to do was to go see them go visit their shop, go visit their racetrack, but we had to do it safely. So this is just a give back. This is something that we're paying for. Uh, this is no cost to the folks that we stop at their facility. Uh, and we're bringing the world's best content creators right to them so they can tell their story and then we can share it. So we started on October 10th. 
70 day tour with 90 stops. We've brought in big media partners to help share the content and it's still going on. It ends next week uh, on December 18th and we're in California right now and there's a, there's a little bit of wrinkle there. I'll talk about that in just a second. This will give you an idea of how uh, the path of the Pure Eye Road Tour came together, starting in Indianapolis, moving around the Midwest, going to the Carolinas, through Atlanta. We did make a stop in Memphis, so some of our big partners there could, could tell their story. Through Dallas, and then over the Thanksgiving break, the team headed to California, and that's where they are now. So how do you do something like this safely? And it is a risk. I'll admit it. It is a risk. Uh, and that might motivate the folks on the bus even more so, right? Knowing that if somebody makes a mistake, if someone gets sick, it's really the end of this thing. So, so far, so good. But but here's how we've managed it, right? And there's uh, Justin Sessler from Driveline Studios getting ready to get on the bus uh, one of the mornings. That's Michelle. She's our uh, logistics expert that's on the bus in charge of the stops. We also have a designated driver, designated in the sense of making sure that everybody on board that bus is safe and gets to the right destination at the right time and gets home safely to the hotel that night. Um, we follow in our state and local guidelines along the way, daily temperature checks. These guys are wearing out the hand sanitizer, which is great. They're issued one or two or three or however they want. We wipe down everything after every stop, every night, every morning. Um, we're also very cautious when we show up, right? We're limiting to only critical staff. Uh, we do have other employees, especially in California, that are gonna be joining us. Uh, we're limiting that so that we don't overwhelm our guest manufacturer. Um, and we're just careful. Wear a mask all day, wipe everything down, be smart about it. And again, so far, so good. So the content has been amazing. We are covering the racing industry one stop at a time. And other companies are getting involved and we're helping them aggregate their story. So uh, what has been the result? Well, the content and the growth on social media for the PR Road Tour has been phenomenal. We'll end up with... Uh, over 25 million media impressions. It's a massive uh, undertaking. Uh, and we're having great engagement, great follower growth on all of our social platform forms. One of our videos went viral, really took off. YouTube labeled it as the uh, the correct video for the topic, the Godzilla crate engine from, from Ford Racing. Well done. Uh, you can see the numbers. If you're really into social media, I'll share with you that uh, Facebook, Instagram, especially those two, they're paid programs. They're, they're not social, they're advertising platforms. So you gotta have a little bit of spend. YouTube is up and coming uh, for PRI. There's a lot there that will be coming, especially this week. Hope you'll tune in. We'll talk about that in a minute. LinkedIn and TikTok, that's not listed on here. We just launched that. They're truly organic. So you'll see a lot of content. If you got good content, your channels will grow. Uh, some fun testimonials from folks that have been on the road tour from Carrie Enders and Tom Boozy and Chris Thornton. Uh, I'll read Chris's. This is a really great idea. We are so appreciative you included us. We have been with PRI since the very beginning, and this is what PRI is all about. And it, it, I really appreciate that personally. The team loves it. Uh, we, we respect the power of the PRI brand, and it's the people. It's the partners like Chris that make it possible. Uh, and without them, uh, PRI doesn't go on. So for us to be out there with them during this time, uh, says a lot about both parties. They wanna keep going, we wanna keep telling their story. So let me, uh, let me quickly go through uh, a little bit about the health of the industry right now. Uh, and if you're not uh, a SEMA member, uh, I urge you to join. You, you have access to great data like this state of the industry from fall of 2020. Uh, Gavin Knapp puts this out under Nathan Ridenauer's group. Just some great stuff. Um, as you're uh, probably aware, there was a early setback or pause in the industry in the March, April, May timeframe, uh, but the racing industry has come charging back. Manufacturer, distributor, retail installer, 
can see that little bit of dip in Q2, Q2 rather, Q3, things are back up uh, and going. Uh, uh, the, the graph on the right, I like this. Um, most businesses, mostly business as usual, or only impacted shortly. Expect 2020 sales to finish higher or similar uh, to 2019. 55% of companies that took the survey uh, expect uh, they're going to finish up higher or similar to 2019. Certainly can do better. We want all companies to be up and growing, um, but we're going to do our part. Uh, moving quickly, uh, retail sales are still strong, even in a pandemic. E-commerce uh, is coming on strong. Uh, this graph shows it. We'll make it available for you for a little bit longer uh, when we cut this. Uh, but uh, again, our uh, industry is finding a way. Uh, and then the racing segment growing both uh, manufacturers and retailers. Uh, the red is decreased. Gray has stayed the same. Blue is increasing. As you can see, race parts for track use only are on the rise, 32% uh, for manufacturers and for retailers, 22%. Uh, so manufacturers are really benefiting from folks staying at home and working on race cars. And that uh, that's good for us, but we've got to keep it going. So I'm going to move quickly now as we're wrapping it up, because I know you're going to have a lot of questions for Karen. Uh, government affairs and what is PRI doing there? Uh, the RPM Act, I hope you've heard about it. Uh, it is SEMA and SEMA's legal team and government affairs uh, team working with the EPA to uh, make uh, the right correction, the right legislation, so that we describe our race cars the right way. There was a language that would... Uh, put racing in jeopardy, SEMA and PRI got in, in there, uh, and we're trying to do the right thing. We certainly could use your help. Educate yourself on the RPM Act uh, and make sure uh, you're aware of what's going on there. Also want to make sure you're aware of what's going on in Georgia. Crazy election year, as we all know. The two Senate seats in Georgia are going to be critical for ensuring the future of racing. It'll keep the power balanced in Washington if the Senate is controlled by the Republicans. So you're going to see PRI uh, get behind Purdue uh, and Loeffler in Georgia. That's a January 5th runoff date, so we're uh, we're going to get more involved there. You can, too, uh, go to performanceracing.com slash vote racing. Uh, stay informed and uh, help the racing industry win Georgia and win the Senate. All right, I uh, want to talk to you a little bit about this week and what we've got coming from PRI. This is a huge part of it. It's been great to be with you. Uh, we're going to be with you all day uh, and all week. This is what PRI has. In lieu of the show, we've gone PRI education, make it available to everyone. If you've been to the PRI show, you know uh, Dan Schechner does a great job with the PRI education lineup. We bring some of the brightest minds from the racing industry available to you. And we have these nice side room settings and people can go in and learn something. We're gonna make it available online. Uh, you can see the lineup. Uh, we've got some great stuff coming your way on Thursday uh, and Friday and then Saturday. And then uh, we've even got some highlight videos that we're gonna release from our last 60 days on the PRI Road Tour. More entertainment stuff but we're, we're going to heavy up uh, with the education. So stay tuned to that. You can find all of that on the PRI website, performanceracing.com. And then uh, for 2021, hey, it's going to be a great year. We're super focused on getting back to the business of the trade show, bringing people together. Uh, that, of course, is going to be dependent on vaccines and what we're allowed to do to bring people together. We've got an exciting new PRI magazine that's coming your way. Uh, it's got new columns, it's got more education, more insights into racing, and I welcome you to get signed up. You can watch it, uh, or you can get issues uh, for free on our website for now, so check that out. Um, make sure you're following uh, PRI on your favorite social feed. If you like Instagram, we've got a great Instagram presence, or LinkedIn. If you like more professional content, we're there as well, or whatever you like or get signed up for our email newsletter. We'll deliver it right to your inbox. A lot of government affairs uh, issues in our future, as you can imagine, 
we're a little bit concerned about how the election uh, has gone or is going. Uh, and if it uh, turns against the racing industry, uh, PRI is going to be there to help unite us and bring us together. And, you know, maybe there's a membership in the future with PRI. So, hey, with that, gang, uh, it's time for Q&A with Tom uh, and Karen Davidson, who's our director of our trade show. She's awesome. You're going to find her to be a real wealth of knowledge uh, on what we've got going on at PRI, how close we were with the trade show, and everything on the road tour. So look, um, again, I want to thank those first responders, those scientists that are out there, uh, and people that are making great strides in the industry of racing. We can't do it without you. Uh, thank you so much. I know you're sacrificing on the front line uh, and then uh, helping the racing industry throughout the weekends and throughout uh, whatever spare time you have. So, folks, uh, thank you so much. Uh, if you if you want to get a hold of me, if you've got uh, questions, get a hold of Tom. Uh, send him a note, and uh, he'll send it on to me or find me on LinkedIn. And, uh, look, I want to wish you all the best uh, for the holidays. Hope you have a great Christmas, uh, and stay safe out there, everybody. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you for your support of PRI uh, and ICMS. It really uh, makes a difference in this industry. So thanks, folks. Have a great day.